Call the meeting to order of the Waitley Select Board of January 27th, 2021. First item on the agenda is meeting minutes. Review and approve meeting minutes from January 13th, 2021. Any comments? Good. I, I would move to uh, accept the minutes, please. Second. Okay, we'll call a vote. Jonathan? Yep. Joyce? Aye. Fred, yes. Okay, moving on. Vendor and payroll warrants. You all received them uh, in uh, attachment to the meeting. Any comments? No. Nope. Oh. I'm all good. Okay, good. fine for me. Okay, next agenda item is public comments uh, for items not listed on the agenda. Anybody have anything else to bring up? Keith, Jim? No? Okay. Moving on, our first our scheduled appointment is with Lori Scarborough of the uh, Franklin County Council of Governments discuss results of follow-up speed studies on Chestnut Plain Road and also a new speed study, uh, Christian Lane, conducted in November of last year, 2020. Okay, Lori, I see you're on. Uh, I'll, turn it over to, I'll turn it over to you. And I, I don't think Brian sent us all the graphs and charts and tables and, and whatever. Uh, I don't know if there's some of that you want to highlight in your presentation or it's, I'll leave it up to you. Um, um, yeah, so do you guys do have the materials that Brian sent? Because oh, I don't really know if I'll be able to share my screen or share anything. I'd, um, so I'd say in that summary of traffic counts from November. Um, so um, yeah, so we were requested to do, um, let's see, follow up. So I think it was um, in the spring uh, or in the summer, um, <clears throat> Yeah, it was in June. Um, we did traffic count on Chestnut Plain Road, north of Haydenville Road, so between Haydenville Road and um, Christian Lane. And uh, in June, and, and at that time, um, he requested uh, that we also do a study on um, Chestnut Plain Road, south of Haydenville Road. Um, so in June, on the northern section of Haydenville Road, the average speed we recorded um, was 34 miles per hour, the 85th percentile speed was 39 miles per hour, and the pace speed, the speed, the 10 mile per hour range that most vehicles are traveling was between 30 and 39, um, as you call the posted speed limit there is 30 miles per hour. Um, so in November, we were able to squeeze, and this was our last batch of traffic counts that we did um, in 2020, um, sort of mid uh, to the end of November, um, we were able to do a repeat count at that same location on um, the northern section of Haydenville Road and also one on the southern segment uh, south of Haydenville Road. I think it was just south of the church. Um, and at that time, so those counters were in place for a couple weeks. Um, and at that time, the speeds that we recorded on Chestnut Plain Road North really did not change in any significant way at all um, from the summertime count. The, the average daily traffic almost didn't change at all either. Um, so it was a pretty uh, similar sample to compare to. And all those metrics were about the same. Actually, the average speed and 40 and uh, 85th percentile speed were recorded as uh, uh, one mile per hour faster in November, uh, 35 and 40 versus 34 and 39 in June. Um, but the pace was the same. And uh, south of Haydenville Road, again, like near the church, uh, much lower traffic volume. The average daily traffic was about 660 vehicles per day, so really less than half of what you see on the other segment. Um, but the speeds were almost exactly the same, uh, 34 mile per hour average speed. 80, uh, 40 mile per hour, 85th percentile speed, and the pace was the same. Um, so not a real significant difference there in the, the overall speed metrics. 
Um, and that at the same time, we we're also requested to do a speed study and volume count on Christian Lane um, between the railroad and somewhere somewhere between the railroad and Long Plain Road. So we were able to get the counter in uh, near number 147 Christian Lane, kind of right in the middle there. Um, and this is the first count we've done on that section of Christian Lane in the recent past. Um, so uh, again, in November, the average daily traffic was a little over a thousand vehicles per day. Um, the average speed uh, and the, in this uh, section, the posted speed limit is 40 miles per hour. And uh, the app, is that right? Am I? No, I'm getting off track, but let's see. So the average speed was 39 and the 85th percentile speed was 44 miles per hour and the pace speed again, the 10 mile per hour range that most the largest portion of vehicles are traveling was uh, 35 to 44. Now I have to open up another document just to double check. Uh, uh, Chief, you could correct me if I'm wrong. Is that posted speed 35 or 40 there? I have to open that. Up. It's 40 miles per hour. It's 40, yeah. So that was, um, I found that interesting actually that the um, 85th percentiles, that the average speed was actually below the posted speed limit, but the 85th percentile speed was uh, 44. Laurie, these uh, traffic counts, are these the raw counts or are these adjusted? Adjusted for seasonality? Um, the volume, that is the raw volume. Okay, so. Yeah, there's no seasonal adjustment factor there. I didn't, I haven't really been applying those. So that's the raw volume that was recorded and I'm going to open that up. Okay, so. it's curious the ones in June compared oh, to November were similar. I'm but, so sorry. Yeah. Hey, Lori. Yeah, no, those are the raw volumes. They're almost exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not doing any seasonal adjustments this year because of the, the wacky traffic patterns all throughout the pandemic. But, um, right. yeah. Is, is there a difference between between rush hour and non-rush hour? Um, let's see. I'm going to look at that. So that's a little bit deeper in... Well, let's to, let's put in your tables. I, I think and what the speeds are? Graph. Yeah. Graph. So I can I can look into that. Let's see. It's sort of been graphed by hour. Um, so let's see. Mm. I don't know that there's a real difference in the speed of travel, except if there you know there can be um, a platoon. You know, if there's one car going slower and other cars catch up to it, that would cause sort of a lower. Um, uh, perceived speed than if those uh, following cars were able to go in a free flow. But um, I don't see that there's a real significant difference in the travel speeds based on the hour, just so the number of people going over or above the posted speed limit. Um, there, well, there are more vehicles in the rush hour, there's going to be more speeding violations. But um, not really significant change in the volume or in the speed. I, mean, I just wonder whether the actual speed. speeds are like over time. Yeah. Yeah. There sure is a periodicity to those yeah, so. um, number of um, number of enforceable violations versus time. I mean, they're yeah. real clear. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of early morning, yeah. and then uh, depending on the day, be somewhere between either two or four o'clock, or sometimes three o'clock. That that's, yeah. those are really places where it stands out to me anyway, when I look at those graphs. Yeah. Yeah. Basic okay. outlines of the speeds. Again, I found it interesting that um, at least on that section of Ch uh, Christian Lane, um, speeding is actually lower than um, than I normally see, honestly. Well, a, a lot of that is probably skewed gonna, because the people- And, and again, the, those counts were, go ahead. Now, I was just saying that a lot of that could be skewed because um, the people who are leaving Yankee Candle um, haven't ramped up their speed sufficiently sure, yet. Sure, so they haven't gotten up to speed. Right. Oh, it was yeah. further east, Fred. Yeah, be, I mean, yeah. John, it was- Oh, is that right? Okay, I'm sorry. Well, the alpaca yeah, I'm farm. not sure exactly. But what okay, I guess yeah. I've, <laughs> what, what I've 
observe myself on, on Christian Lane is during summer months with, with the farmers out there with the equipment, I see more people, I think, speeding, passing the farmer, farm's equipment, farmer equipment is going slower. I think that there's a greater potential in the summer months for, for higher speeds than there are in November when you don't have hardly any farm equipment out there, so. But at the same point in time, the, those farm vehicles that are going slow will 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 bring the numbers. It will skew the numbers down too. Right, but you, you may get a, yeah. A they'll get recorded as well. As the average. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it could go either way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, but, I wouldn't expect a real significant change between summer and, and November. There will probably be some variation, but I wouldn't imagine that there would be these numbers would be jumping by five or ten miles per hour It'll maybe be slightly higher but not significantly and we probably didn't have much school traffic either when schools were closed in november i don't remember mm -hmm. uh, yeah um yeah this, this, this period did include the thanksgiving holiday yeah um but yeah i don't know i think all your schools are all schools are closed and emas has been closed Okay. So, uh, what have, what have you observed? Is Jim still with us? Uh, yep, I'm here, Fred. Yeah. What what have you observed with with these uh, this data? You uh, this is what you think was reflective out there, and and are you altering your traffic monitoring to to try to reduce some of these speeds? What are you doing differently, if anything? Well, again, the main the main focus being up on Chestnut Plain Road. Um, we did do a bunch of enforcement up there. Uh, I think the last time we looked at some numbers was probably back in October, late October before the study. <clears throat> um, we're looking at, what I, I think I've got about, what is it, 100 and, 72, 172 calls that were entered for traffic enforcement, um, area patrols up in, up in the center of town. Uh, that's really what we've been tracking up there. Um, most of the officers that have been doing enforcement up there, they, when, when we first ramped this up back in June, um, they saw a, a significant decrease um, and they, the speeding, I mean, people were, were going slower. They, they kind of knew that we were there. We were up in that area all the time. We had the signs posted up there. Um, we were also watching the stop sign and <clears throat> things started to slow down after, after a few weeks, we started noting a, noticing a significant change. Um, but then as anything else, we moved the signs to a different road. Um, we started doing enforcement and other other locations and then you know speed gradually climbs back up to where it was before so i think the the numbers seem consistent with what with what we see when we're doing enforcement um you know sitting up there we're just we're not seeing people going 50 60 miles an hour um through that area it's it's consistent with the numbers that we're seeing and down in christian lane you know i, I think the big concern is the uh, yankee candle traffic those are the big waves that, that people always complain about because there's a lot of cars and they leave the parking lot and accelerate quickly. <clears throat> I think those were a lot of the concerns down there. Um, but again, that's, that's more, that's more sporadic. Um, the, when you have everybody leaving at the same time, not everybody is, is speeding. Um, so we've, we've done enforcement down by the tracks. We've done enforcement further down. Um, and, you know, aside from a, a couple of complaints from specific people which we're addressing um, with with those people I, I don't think we're seeing a widespread issue down there I think the you know the complaints of people going over the railroad tracks at 60 70 miles an hour I, I just don't see that um, and we're not seeing it with our, our officers and any of our enforcement either so the numbers seem consistent with what we're with what we're seeing 
And this is, I mean, these are just the two roads that we have the numbers on. We do the same thing <clears throat> without numbers. We do the same things on pretty much every other road in town as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of consistent with what we've seen right along for, for the past few years. Okay. And, and I guess I was surprised that on Chestnut Plain Road North, the November counts were very similar to the June ones after I think Keith did the, the major resurfacing project there, which a lot of times you see after you do a major resurfacing, speeds increase. Cars go faster, they're more comfortable driving the road. Now maybe it didn't impact it here because the, the section was so short and in the center of town and, this, and the speed limit was lower. But uh, I think typically you, you see when you have a new pavement on there, speeds go up. Uh, Jonathan may have noticed that when, when you did Swamp Road a year or two ago, that people were going faster then. So, well, Fred, people have always gone fast on Swamp Road. It's the nature of the beast. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to yeah, answer your question, Fred. Chess and Plain Road included more. Yeah, go ahead. To Fred, the speed did go up one mile from June to yeah. November. Well, okay. On the new yeah. pavement. Yeah. Yeah, and we um, and that is also there's also the new crosswalks as well. And yeah, I noticed that it was very similar, but just a slightly higher. And I wonder if maybe people were um, happy to get back up to normal speed after they'd been been slowed down by the construction for the months or two preceding. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was expecting maybe, um, I think now that the new crosswalks and signs are in place, I think once people get accustomed to those, we may see a slightly lower speed. So I'm planning to come back in the spring, late spring, early summer, after that's been in place for about six months, just to see if there is any um, long-term effects on, on speed from the, the, um, the complete streets work. Okay, and I don't remember exactly what people on Chestnut Plain had an issue with, with the speeds in town, because if you go further south of, of the center of town, uh, even past Claverick Road where it gets pretty open, and I, I think the speed limits change, don't they, to 40 once you get through there? And it may be more open, straight road. I, I'm just assuming people may travel faster there. I don't know if that was a concern or not. Well, that was one of the reasons why we asked for it to be south, uh, to have one down there. So my question was going to be maybe Keith uh, or Jim could answer it is, um, how far south of the church was that? Was it like close to Claverick Road in the area? Because that's the area where people are complaining about the area oh, where okay. 40 miles an hour and you've got that big hill going down and everybody speeds up. By the time you get to the top of the next hill, right. I'm not surprised nobody's speeding. <laughs> but uh, but it's okay, the people yeah, so who are in was... that area at the bottom that are the, that are the ones doing the complaining. Uh, and they've also okay. emailed to thank us for the sign, uh, the speeding sign too, by the way. Um, I think the, the purpose for the, the study was to stay within that 30 mile per hour zone um, so well, that was not the purpose right that I put that out. That was my understanding. Okay. Um, okay. That was my no, understanding. I, I didn't so, want to keep um, it in that area. I wanted to keep it in the area where people <laughs> are perceiving a speeding problem. Because I think if we put it down there, then we'll see a lot more 50s and 60s um, down in that area. And that's really the area that people are complaining about south of, of Chestnut Plain Road, or the, the south part of Chestnut Plain Road. That's so just maybe that's for the next time. South. we see the, the 60 mile an hour. That's just not consistent with what we see. Right. We do see speeds increase coming down the mm -hmm. hill or you know, mm -hmm. one way or the other uh, coming right. out of but, town or going into the yeah. center of town. Coming but, down but having the data of looking at the 600 cars yeah. and seeing, you know, how I agree. We, I agree. Like, that would the data's, be data has been <laughs> consistent with what, with what we kind of see when we're out there patrolling. Right. I mean, we're the ones out there watching traffic all the time. I, I, I understand, yeah. but you don't you don't do every single car. Right? And and that's what the data it's nice about the data. It captures over that particular period of time pretty much every car. 
Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out in the data, and I don't know if anybody else noticed this, was that, I mean, the ones we're really worried about are people going way too fast for the speed limit. And to me, the striking difference between Christian Lane and Chestnut Plain Road is how many more incidents of um, over 55 you know, so in that over 55 to 60, over 60 to 65, there's a lot more of those numbers. There's a lot more numbers in those columns than there are for Chestnut Plain Road, either north or south. Um, and it might be that the, because the, the speed limit is uh, a little higher, but the speed limit is not 50 out there. Uh, you know, 55 is, is 15 miles over the limit. And so to me, I mean, that's through a residential neighborhood with kids. So to me, that's the thing, that's the place where I feel like we're getting information about uh, a problem and it's primarily eastbound. So it, maybe it's Yankee Candle folks going home from work and heading that way and heading for the Sunderland Bridge for the other side of the river. Um, it doesn't seem to be as much but there is some on the uh, westbound traffic. Okay, so sorry, that's that's just my observations from looking at the data. Well, and, and some may depend on, I guess when Jim is doing a monitoring, if he's not doing it in late evening or early morning hours, that could be when the, the speeds ex exceed the speed limit. I, I don't remember looking at the graphs here. Mm. They probably show that the hours of the day, but yeah, it it does show the hours of the day. Those are the yeah. early morning, yeah. and, you know, mid mid to late afternoon. Uh, mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the times, and those aren't <clears throat> those times aren't really consistent with Yankee Candle traffic. Um, you know, the seven to eight o'clock in the morning, they're already in work or they're already right. gone. Um, so between mm -hmm. seven and eight o'clock, they're that's that's not usually Yankee Candle traffic. Yeah. Same thing up in the yeah. center of town as well. Yeah, I was thinking of the uh, the two p.m hump there's always it seems to be a 2 p.m time well and we have some businesses that are closed now too that aren't open so yeah it could affect it hours the speed limit hours of speeding so so jim in yeah. terms of moving forward we have the we have one of the electronic message boards that has the radar unit did we get the software for the for the data collection that that update we did. Um, okay. the, the data collection, um, from from what I can tell, it, it just gives, and I, I've got to look into it a little bit more. I may have to put a call in to them. I've, I've got a, a manual for it, uh, but it looks like it gives us kind of limited information. It's it's not anywhere near the, you know, the, the information that we're getting. And depending on how I run the report, I, I get different information. So um, I've got a Play around with that a little bit more to get to get better figures um, as far as the you know that speed sign that traffic sign that we have goes. Okay, but that only gives you like incidents. You can't tell the vehicle or, or vehicle type on that, can you? Mm -hmm. No. No, just the number of times that somebody goes that speed. speed no. limit. It just right. it just so, documents the whenever the radar is activated. Does it, 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 it must give date and time of day and, and things like that, though. It does. Okay. Does it have capability of doing video? It does recording? not. Video recording? No? Nope. And then also with the with the burn grant that we were that, that we applied for and were awarded, that, that's going to purchase four that's correct. Uh, yes. Yes. speed feedback signs. Yeah, and from what I from what I gather, those the software for those um, those signs is much more in depth than with the um, kind of the generic software of the the speed sign. And those are, and those are so those are going to be pole mounted, um, and I think we said four. We were we were we asked for four, right? Yes, four. four. We can we can mount those on telephone poles. We can mount them on mm -hmm. on their own pole. Um, I think once. Once we get those, I think it's probably prudent to have a, a conversation as to where we should where we should put those together. Much more data because they're not going to stay there for a week. They may stay there for two or three months. Um, it's not something that we're going to be moving around 
like we move around the, the speed sign now. Right. So, so when you have, when those are out there for, for, I don't know how many months we want to do three or four months, they can be moved, but we'll also have the data from those three or four months. So you guys, but you guys, meaning the, the police department can do targeted enforcement Correct. during those times of days that you identify as problematic. Yep. Yep. We can download the data daily. We can download it once a week, once a month, you know, whatever, whatever we want to, to download the data to, to get a better idea um, of time frames. Yeah. That sounds good, Jim. And I guess I would rely on you to come up with a program of where you want to put these once you had some experience with them and know what the data shows. I think otherwise we're just going to be hit and miss locations that may not mean anything. So. So, so Lori, when, and if you come back and are, are doing Chestnut Plain Road North in the spring, you said, could you also do the, the, the Chestnut Plain Road mm -hmm. South in the vicinity of Clavarack, is that is that right, Joyce? Yes. Yeah. You should that be further is, south. South of Clavarack? Or yeah, it could be south of Clavarack. That okay. would be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have that. that on my, yeah, definitely. We can absolutely do that. Um, I have it. I have a reminder to um, put that on my calendar. But also, when we start up in March or whenever weather starts, seems like it's going to permit. Um, Brian, I'll, I'll send you the, the reminder of the annual traffic counting season. So you can hopefully remind me to get that down further south. But yeah, you can be specific about where exactly you want it. But that's no problem. Okay. Thank you. I guess in the meantime, Jim could do yeah. some monitoring in that location, right? To see if there's what the speeds are. Yep. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we've been doing right along. Just, okay. Just kind of focusing in that area along uh, Chestnut Plain Road. Okay. Are we are we done with this uh, item? Okay. I'd like to thank Lori for for all your time and, and actually doing the the counts, and gathering the data for us out there, and and continuing uh, to do it more than once, and for analyzing it and, and presenting it in some meaningful. Uh, form, I guess, uh, and for making a presentation today. So again, Lori, thank you. Thanks for COG for their assistance to the town. You're welcome. Absolutely. Uh, we could help. And, uh, please, yeah, if you have any more questions, let me know. Okay, we, we know where you're okay. at. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Yes, you do. <laughs> have okay. a good evening. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, moving on. Uh, next item on the agenda is the COVID-19 state of emergency. Uh, we got two items, uh, directives for town employees returning and also uh, paid leave uh, policy section that Brian is proposing to do. Okay, Brian, I'll turn this over to you. Yep, sounds good. So we talked at the last meeting, at the last select board meeting, how the, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, certain provisions of it expired on uh, December 31st. And really just to summarize those, uh, what was in place um, under the FFCRA was that employees were allowed 80 hours paid sick leave uh, for employees who were uh, under a lawful quarantine order or they were experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, or they were seeking a medical diagnosis um, of COVID-19. So uh, essentially waiting for testing. Um, the FFCRA also provided 80 hours paid sick leave um, for employees to care for an individual subject to quarantine or for a child um, whose school or, or child care provider were closed due to COVID-19. And then there was the, ex um, the expanded Family Medical Leave Act portion of that, and that was 10 weeks um, at two thirds pay um, for employees who's, um, who needed to care for a child, again, whose school or provider uh, were closed due to COVID-19. So those expired on, on December 31st, and they were not renewed in the most recent uh, federal legislation. Um, there's, there's some discussion that, that 
that further uh, federal laws or, or federal legislation may address it again, uh, but that's yet to be seen. Um, and we talked at the last meeting um, about which, if any of these provisions that, that we might be interested in, in providing for employees on a temporary basis. And I think the one that, that, I, that I went back and drafted is really addressing just the first one. It, it's, it's number one on the screen here. The employee is unable to work um, and unable to telework. We wanted to make sure that, um, that if they could work from home um, and they're up to it, that they do work from home. Um, because the employee is quarantined due to a possible exposure to COVID-19. Um, so quarantine due to possible exposure. And again, this gets to the lawful quarantine order from the federal, state, or local government. Um, or the employee is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and seeking a diagnosis, or the employee has received a positive COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, I think that's what we had discussed. We really want to we really want to make sure that that nobody has to choose between coming to work sick or possibly sick and getting paid. Um, and I, that's, um, I think, what we had talked about considering at the next meeting should be this meeting. Um, and number two talks about um, consistent with the existing law that the that the town could seek documentation um, that these conditions actually exist, that they, that, that they don't have to take um, an employee's word for it. Um, the idea is that this would be temporary. Um, and I, the way I was thinking was that when the when the local state of emergency is lifted by, by the board, that, that most of these probably, if not all these directives need to be reviewed and, and most of them rescinded. Um, but it was really to try to get at that, that one specific situation where there's there's been an actual exposure to COVID-19 or somebody is actually sick um, that they not choose between getting paid and uh, coming to work sick. Brian, I have two, two questions. One is on the number one condition here. If somebody either has symptoms or don't know if they have symptoms and they go get tested and it takes several days to get the results, can they claim sick leave until they get the results? What was the what was the first part of your of your question? If they have symptoms or or, or don't know if they have sim symptoms, and they go get tested, and the test results don't come back for several days, can they claim uh, sick leave for them days if they're home waiting for the test results? Yeah, I think that's the intent of the. Or the employees experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis. But if what if they're not? Don't have symptoms and they just want to go get tested and won't know for three days. The, uh, I mean, yeah. Sorry, the the uh, the lag is no longer there, Fred. You get the, the generally at the public testing places, you get the the text back within um, twenty four hours. Well, I um, told and and I and I honestly, I think. Uh, that's that particular situation would not be covered here the way I read it. Um, if you're experiencing symptoms and you're seeking a medical diagnosis, meaning you've taken a test, you're waiting, that's covered. But if you're not experiencing symptoms and you're going for an asymptomatic test, I think that's not covered here. I think they would not be able to claim sick leave once they got a positive diagnosis, then that's, you know, that then they fall into one of the other categories. But um, I think what you described isn't covered here if it's asymptomatic. If it's symptomatic, yeah. that's covered. Asymptomatic, not covered. Yeah, do you think that's what it says too, Brian? Well, can I can I can I jump in for one quick second, Joyce? And because sure. I think that the other variable is asymptomatic, but you've been exposed to someone who has tested positive then you went to get tested, not because you have symptoms, but because you of the potential exposure. So you may be covered positive. in the first one. The sub, uh, if you're uh, quarantined due to possible exposure to COVID-19, okay. that's that you're covered there. Right. That's the okay. first, that's the very first category. 
I mean, I go in for asymptomatic testing twice a week because my employer requires me to, but <laughs> they're not making me wait to get, you know, uh, a green light to do any work. Right. I can still come in and do my work while I'm awaiting the, the test results. It, is, it doesn't make sense otherwise, I don't think. Well, I, I've heard different stories where, yeah, you can get it within the results within minutes or hours and then also a days, depending where you go and whether you get a referral from a doctor or somebody or not. Uh, that, may, that was probably true um, until a few months ago, but now you can go to UMass or GCC. There's probably other places as well. It's very easy to go in, get a test, you know, you give them your contact information and you've got, I've got many friends who do that because they don't work at a place where my generous employer will test me for right. free. Um, so so this is, I'm hearing this from people who use UMass and GCC. It's really good. It's not like it was months ago when it took three days or longer to get your results. It's 24 hour turnaround now. Consistently. Yeah. Okay. And the, the second question I had is, is, who is kind of monitoring or in charge of this? Is it Brian and your staff or is it the Board of Health? And kind of where do people go if they meet this condition? Do they go Board of Health or do they go to you? Or, or uh, what's the process? Um, they, I, I think they would um, talk to me or their, or their direct supervisor because they're the ones that are going to be, they're, they're the ones that are going to be dealing with timesheets and, and the like. Um, and, and they definitely need to talk to their, supervisors if if they've had exposures and that's really what this is trying to get to is, is if somebody's been exposed or they're having symptoms they, they do need to they do need to contact their supervisors and let them know because there's additional steps that that we may need to take in consultation with the board of health so that's where it would start but we would definitely like like we have for the past what is it going on 12 yeah. 10 months now Mm -hmm. that we've dealt with this. Uh, I mean, I probably have, Fran's probably heard from me more than he likes, but. <laughs> okay. I think this is good. Okay. Do we need to take an action on this? I would think yeah. so, right? I, I would uh, move that we, um, we approve the temporary COVID-19 paid sick leave directive. Um, that uh, we've been discussing for the last several minutes. Second. Okay, any uh, further discussion? All right, I just have, just have a quick question maybe for Brian. Uh, if we did have somebody test positive, um, they had to be quarantined and we're gonna cover them under this, how is that gonna be applied for say a, a part-time police officer? Are we just listing that as sick time? Do you wanna, how do you want us to if it does come up, how do you want us to list that on a pay sheet? Um, I, I think you should note that it that it's COVID nineteen paid sick leave. Um, okay. That way we can track because I mean it it's it's eighty hours, similar to what FFCRA was. It's eighty hours on top of what everybody has. So once if they needed to use their eighty hours, then they would have to use their regular sick time. So we want to be able to track it. Okay. The part timer, Jimmy. Do, do the part timers get sick time? They're they're not benefited employees, right? But I think the, I I don't know that this this says only benefited employees. If it, it, we it, have it, an officer that's going to be working a shift or test positive for something, I'm not sure why why they wouldn't be covered as well. I, didn't I read somewhere that is prorated to the number of hours you would normally work? At the um, bottom of the page. Part yeah, the very yeah, the very bottom of the page. Oh, yeah. yeah. But but I think we had earlier discussions of, of I, I guess part part-time uh, police officers working and if they weren't scheduled to work and came down with a case, whether they would be covered or not. And I guess we're we're back to discussing it again. If if they're not scheduled and you have, I don't know, nine or ten off part-time officers that could happen any time that they come down with it. Does that mean they're eligible for no? Right. Pay? Yeah, I think it would just be if 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 somebody tested positive for something, or tested positive for COVID, and they're supposed to work that the next day or the next within the next couple of days. Um, I don't I don't think they should have to 
suffer. I mean, it's not necessarily their fault that they came down with it. Right, Jim, they're 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 on if they're on the schedule already for a given week, they would get the prorated benefit. But you yeah. do this, you do your schedule on a weekly basis, right? Monthly. Oh, monthly. But again, if they're if it's three weeks out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it's if it's three weeks out, I mean they're they're gonna be past the, the two week quarantine and all that stuff anyways. And thanks, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Okay. Do we need any discuss any of the other COVID uh, directives, Brian? I, I don't believe so. I just want to mention that on our website, there's a, a there's a news article that talks about those folks over 75 years old are eligible to schedule appointments. Um, and there's a link on the website that that folks can click on um, under the state plan uh, persons over 75 years old I believe are eligible for vaccinations starting February 1st um, so that's where folks can go if they need more information um, it, it, the link is to the uh, mass.gov vaccination site um, and then I believe the next group after 75 is uh, people who are over 65 years old so those folks should also uh, sort of keep tabs on, on where everything is and how it's progressing. Um, and then I think it's people with um, two or more comorbidities, I think, are next. And then right. we get into some type um, some type of occupations in terms of teachers and, and, and sort of frontline workers or public-facing workers. Um, so... So that site will be uh, uh, updated as, as needed as it goes as it occurs. Conditions yeah, occur. the site that it links to it, it is this, is the mass.gov site, and that's updated. Um, I, I assume it's updated daily in terms of the locations where people can um, make appointments. Um, I think most of our first responders have had at least the initial um, dose of the vaccine. Um, and I think, so Jim, your second one is, well, I don't know if you did it, but I don't need to know your medical history, but um, first responders in Waitley would get a 23 weeks later? 28 days. Yeah. So we're, we're, days. Scheduled, we're scheduled to start uh, February 11th for our next round of shots. February 11th will be the, the first, first two officers will go and then the next two will go on the 12th. And then I think we only have one officer that that's not going to be doing it just because he's going to be traveling and can't make the second round of uh, vaccinations. Yep. Okay. Moving on. Uh, uh, under old business, uh, discuss the next steps in the merger of the Whateley Water District into the Whateley Water Department and to vote on extending the existing contract with Berkshire Design Group for engineering services related to the merger project. Okay, Brian, you put together some uh, outlines of, of different phases and steps and activities that need to be done. You wanna- Yeah, this is, it's definitely subject to change, but um, this is something I put together after I, after, um, I had a call with um, the water department, water district, um, Lynn and we also Lynn and I also had a call with Berkshire Design Group. That's the engineers who have been working on the project, um, and it just really lays out all of the steps that need to be taken for this project to be completed. Um, I think the schedule is optimistic, but our but my hope is is that is that they can they can complete this and, and have the switchover hopefully by October. Um, the switchover meaning that the water department will begin servicing the former water district. Um, so you recall that that Mass, D, Mass DEP did approve the, the connection. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of upfront work that needs to be done. Um, and um, we're just gonna have to get at it. Um, you know, one of the first things that needs to happen is, is the water department needs to work on um, the agreement that they're going to have each water uh, department customer signs a uh, 
an agreement with the water department. This one needs to be tweaked a little bit to address hookup fees. Uh, the commissioners also need to um, have further discussions about whether they want any type of um, payment options instead of just the pay by X date. Uh, I know we had some initial discussion. The select board had some initial discussions with them at a, jo at a joint meeting. Um, um, easement acquisition, we still need uh, to work with Ann to, to get the um, a little bit of a larger easement. There's an easement that goes through there now where the water main is under the ground, but uh, we need to go, it needs to be a little bit wider. There's gonna be some permitting that needs, to, some local permitting that needs to take place um, in terms of the building that's gonna be built. Um, the water department has a, um, has town meeting approval to borrow. Um, I think it's actually a little bit higher than 200,000. Um, so that actually needs to be executed. Um, so that'll happen fairly soon. Uh, procurement and contracting, again, we need to identify what the different procurement steps are based on the value of the services or goods they're going to uh, be purchasing, uh, actual construction, and then everything needs to be done with uh, Mass DEP's blessing and okay. So all this was, was I was optimistically saying we could, we would need to do this by the end of March. Um, so that's optimistic, but it's something to shoot for. Um, this this space. Good night, everyone. Thanks, See you. Thanks, Thank you. Um, um, before you go on, can you go back up to phase one? Yeah. Are are some of these now? now these are activities that you yourself are going to be involved in that you think you need to be involved in, right? Um, I'm. I did a lot of thinking about this today and um, some of them, yes, some of them, some of them, I think we may have to, or the water department may consider if they could uh, push some of this over to the, the engineering firm that they have uh, in terms of some of the things that, that the town needs to be involved in is that de definitely the easement acquisition, um, the contract, in the user agreement modifications, we're going to have to engage town council in that. Right. Um, I'm hopeful maybe permitting can can be something that they can um, push off to their engineers. Um, Lynn's going to need to do the borrowing as a treasurer collector, yeah. um, and then procurement and contracting. Again, that's I want to have discussions with Wayne about this if, if we can push some of that off to the engineers as well. Okay. Um, so. So you haven't identified on this list which ones that they, or, or if we extend, let me go back a minute. If we extend a contract with Berkshire Design, some of these activities will be done by them, or is that going to be an additional cost if we want them to do some of these? Um, so the original agreement was was that the next phases in terms of construction, in terms of bidding and construction, that that they were going to. Um, it was going to be an hourly rate, not a lump sum, like um, the original um, four. I think it was four tasks, three tasks. Um, at, at this at this stage of the project, um, the 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 amount of work that they're going to need to put in is a little bit less defined because um, it's going to depend on really how often we need them. It's not prepare you know these design prepare these engineering plans for this project. It's going to be you know, the water department going to them with questions and depending on the complexities of the question, as an example would be, would dictate how much time the engineer needs to put in. So is, is there provisions for extra costs then for the consultant beyond what you're asking for? Yeah, the, con the, the contract reads that it would be provided at, at an hourly rate. And I include that I asked them for updated rates. Um, so we have about nine thousand dollars left in the account that was um, originally appropriated for this project, and then we have another fifteen thousand um, dollars in another grant account that we can access. Okay, now, I, I'm thinking back to you know what we did for the town hall project. You know, we hired. Uh, a consultant to manage the whole thing and, and oversee the construction and all that. 
and I see for that project, they did a lot more with, with less input maybe from, from the, the town that it was, which worked fine. Here I see kind of the opposite, I guess, more input from the town and town doing more and a consultant, I guess, on a sideline, if we need him, he's there. I don't know, it's, it seems we should rely more on a consultant and, and if we have to pay for it, fine. We're gonna get a benefit from it, from, from a, an experienced contract consultant versus versus your time, Brian, trying to learn and figure out what to do in the communication and all of that. Uh, it, it, it's one or, one or the other. And, and I, I think uh, we should be relying more on, on a consultant to do this, do some of this. Yeah, and that's, that's the way that my thinking has shifted, <laughs> shifted throughout the day. Um, I, I think we need to rely on them more. The difficulty is that the, well, the difference here is the water department is, is, and this might be an argument as to why we need the engineer more, but the water department is essentially acting as their own general contractor and they want to, they want to, you know, and they, they want to do a lot of the construction themselves, but also coordinate electrician and, and, and plumbers and those types of things. So I don't know that they have, or, or we have the experience to do that. So I, I agree, Fred, I, I think we do need to get the engineers more involved or recommend to them that the engineers get more involved and, and, you know, myself probably take a step back and, and, and just coordinate more and um, sort of make sure everything's getting done instead of actually doing it. Right. And, and yeah. And I understand some of the things you have to do or the town has to do that involved the legal requirements of it and getting committee approvals and, and all that kind of stuff. Yes, that's the right place for it. But, uh, the other stuff, as you were well aware for the town hall, I mean, the, the design engineer handled a lot of that for us and did a good job. I mean, we were involved in it. It's not like you're turning it over and closing your eyes till the final bill comes in. And if, if this uh, design firm doesn't want to do it, I don't know, maybe hire somebody else to help you or oversee it. Now, we did that for the complete streets for the sidewalk. We hired, uh, I think, uh, uh, Sarah Campbell to oversee the construction of it, to monitor that rather than either Keith or, or you there doing it and making sure it was done. You know, maybe that's another option here is to hire somebody if the Berkshire Design doesn't want to do it all. How firmly can we recommend this to the Water Commission without overstepping our boundaries? Um. I don't think we'll get any pushback. Okay. I mean, they are a separate, you know, a quasi entity, obviously. So I just want to be careful. Right. I mean, it would be great if they would just say, this is great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like there's at least some room in the budget to pay for these services. Uh, Brian mentioned two sources. Yeah. And I, what I don't have a good feel for is how much of the this do list that you've given us can be pushed off to the engineers. I completely agree with, with Fred's reasoning. If we've got somebody, if we can hire somebody who already knows how to do it, to do it more efficiently, it's absolutely a better use of your time to just shove those off on this, to the person who can do it. Um, I don't have a good sense of how much of this list can be um, taken care of that way with the budget that you've mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a question I would need to pose to them, but uh, they should be able to do C permitting. They should be able to do, I'm, I'm hoping that they can do um, the procurement and um, we'll have to be involved in the contract thing a little bit. Um, construction oversight, engineering oversight and, and interfacing with mass DEP are all activities that mm -hmm. I would want them to do. Yeah. So the question is, right, what's the cost? Is it within what we have? And I would hope so. Yeah. But <laughs> hope so is not a great, <laughs> great response. It, it, it does sound I'll like, find out. like prioritizing um, that there are going to be things where you're, you know, if, if your learning curve is this much, then it's that maybe that could go either way. But if the learning curve is bigger, that definitely um, 
and you said this is not a static document. <laughs> right. So um, that may be changing with time, but I, yeah, I, I can't see arguing with the, either John's or Fred's reasoning. It seems like a better use of your time to make use of that budget since it's already budgeted and that's, we really want it done right. You know, this is an important project. Yeah. The other thing I like to say, um, I think it's reflected some in the contract there. And, and Brian, you were familiar again with the town hall project. There was only meetings. We met every, what, two weeks, I think, with, with the contractor and the architect to go over changes, things that were needed, uh, progress, things like that. Uh, I would like to see something like that in here. Otherwise, this is going to go on. Every day you're going to get a call. Oh, we need to do this. And have you procured this? And and we need to have a meeting to talk about it. I mean, you're going to spend a lot of your time just doing that every day to try to schedule either weekly meeting, set time Monday at eight o'clock or whatever, or every two weeks and, and let stuff go until that time, unless it's really critical, you know, that, that they do it. And then the water commission should step in. If it's something really critical, it needs an answer right away. Uh, I think something like that would, would help you manage your time better rather than being on call all the time. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I agree with that. And that's something we could, we could, we could have an understanding with, with, with the engineers, but in terms of, in terms of actual um, project specific questions, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea about off. plumbing or, or water systems. So, I, I mean, know. And if they want to involve you in a, in a decision for that, I, I mean, <laughs> that can I, happen every day, I guess. But <laughs> I, I would I would defer to those with more knowledge than myself about those kind of things. So okay, um, okay. So what do we need to? Do you want to continue? You were going into the other phases here. Yeah, this is phase two. Again, these these dates are tentative. Um, yeah, you know. During this time period, after after they put, send out the contracts, there's going to be a, a payment deadline, and they're going to there's going to, have to be some type of um, they're going to have to keep track of that, um, and they're going to have to just if they do go down the route of, of financial hardship requests, they're going to have to process those, um, and they're going to conduct procurement, and they're going to obtain equipment, um, and they're going to communicate with with Mass DEP. Um, phase three is is really about the same. Um, again, they're going to be getting equipment in, in, in construction, uh, communication with Mass DEP. And then we were hoping by the end of October, hopefully that, that it could be turned on uh, and the connection could be made. Um, and this is, this is really post-connection stuff that needs to happen. Um, we're going to have a 12-month note that's going to need to be paid off. Hopefully they've collected uh, the amount that they need to to pay off the um, to pay off what's the ban, which is called the bond anticipation note, which is temporary borrowing. Um, if not, they're going to have to figure out um, what they want to do in terms of free borrowing or, or temporarily or borrowing from themselves, borrowing from their, uh, uh, their free cash, essentially, their retained earnings um, and collecting that back after um and around the same time when it when the system is turned on the way the water district is going to discontinue their wells um and at that point um the Waitley water district will will enter into um its dissolution uh dissolution phase um town meeting approved um filing special legislation to dissolve the water district um and that would be the the steps that the water district would actually take um, to dissolve itself as a as a as an organization. Um, so that's our hope as to what will happen and when. In terms of okay. in terms of the Berkshire design agreement, um, the period of performance is number three. Um, the period, the original period of performance for for the, for the agreement was June 30th, 2017. 
unless an extension to complete the services is granted by a majority weight, uh, majority vote of the Whitley Select Board. So that's what we would do tonight is we would need a vote of the Select Board to extend the period of performance on the agreement, let's say until, I mean, well, I guess we could say next January, next February, um, to allow some time that this goes over. Um, 12 months is pretty clean. The end of January, January 31st, maybe. Okay. So we're just agreeing extending it, not, not the cost, or we're agreeing with the, well, we are at hourly rates, I guess, right? Right. Right. The agreement talks about, about those phases as being um, hourly rates. So yeah, we'd be we'd be agreeing to uh, this might uh, be bidding and construction hourly rates. Yeah. Okay. This might be kind of a rookie question, but it seems like this is a contract that was essentially finished in twenty seventeen. Is there some reason why we're not just making a new contract? Or is it really that there's work specified in this contract that hasn't gotten done yet? And we just extending it is the is the more expedient way to do things. I guess that's my basic question. Um it could be done really I think it could be done either way. Um this is the way that um they had asked to do it. Um and they thought that would be easiest. Um, but the more that I've thought about it today, I, I, I might agree that if we're going to ask them to do these more specific things in terms of permitting um, in procurement, it might, it might make more sense to be a different agreement. So are there water commissioners comfortable with continuing with this design group or are they are they the ones that want to just or don't care well I don't know I, I guess I've, I've heard some mixed reaction I guess I'll say that about continuing now I don't know what you've heard lately but I've heard nothing but positive things about about Berkshire design group um, okay I don't have much good to say about previous engineers with similar names. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but to Joyce's point, I wonder if it does. If they respond favorably to to my suggestion that they become more involved, it, I think it might make more sense to. Right. To be a little bit more specific. Yeah, because if the tasks you want don't fit under one of these things that were you know maybe wasn't anticipated on December first of twenty sixteen. Yeah. Uh, that letter that. Um, that describes what kind of the scope of that contract is. I mean, there are some, you know, assistance during bidding and construction. Wetlands permitting is in there. Uh, design and DEP permit. Um, that's presumably things that were not done in that 2017 framework that could be done. So, yeah, so I, guess, I just ask because I don't really know um, and would it be a significant delay if we had it as a separate agreement? Is that is that giving you hours and hours and hours of more work that for a very marginal, um, uh, marginally better situation? I don't know. I just don't know the answer to those. Yeah. If they were just doing the traditional bidding and construction oversight, I, I think just... <laughs> setting it as an hourly rate is fine, but I think if they're gonna do more, um, I think we should probably have a revised scope of work at the very least. So what do you need from us to keep this moving forward, Brian? I mean, it, before we were gonna just vote to extend yep. our relationship, can we still do that? And then as part of that vote, just say, whether it's a new scope of work or it's a, an addendum to this scope of work, will be left to you and the water commissioners? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's that's fine. That that would work. I just don't want to hold things up. Right. At least right. the conversation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Comment I have, this started in 2016, and I know there is, so we're, look, three years, four years almost beyond this date. Mm, yeah. I know there's there's conditions and, and things have changed and there's been roadblocks and and delays, whatever, all throughout the, the, the project so far. How comfortable are, are we that if we go with this design group that it's going to meet the schedule for the next uh, next well, end of this calendar year we're talking? We're talking uh, more or less in a year. Yeah. How comfortable well, are we that they're going to help us meet that date? Or are we going to be back to where we are now arguing about a three or four year contract? We can we can put in a clawback, Fred, where you know they, they are financially penalized if they don't hit certain schedule metrics. And that's what I would suggest we do because you're right. I mean, we can't have this drag on. Yeah. Um, but if we provide incentives based upon contractual hours, hours worked, um, you know, that we, we, you know, maybe we hold back 10%. I don't know what the, what that, what that design would look like, but, make it financially uh, problematic for them not to hit the schedule that we lay out. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Jonathan, because I could see this continuing on and we're stuck with the contract for them doing it because we said we wanted them to do it. And it's at their time, not ours. Brian, is that plausible or is that does that fly in the face of about 25 laws <laughs> well I, I i might regret saying this but um i don't really i don't think that would be necessary with this with this company with this group um uh, initially there was there was a a person working on the project who was less than responsive and now we have um two other people who are working on the project Along with that person, one of them has been very responsive and has um, a very good reputation. He's been working with the water department on um, not only this, but also on the uh, the booster pumps that need to go in at the um, uh, the main pump house. Uh, so I'm very comfortable with with those folks. And I think Wayne is as well. Um, they've been nothing but responsive when the, when we had the other folks come on. And, and I think part of what happened with the other, the original person was semi-retired and, and there wasn't any, there wasn't an incentive from, from our end to really push um, like it, like it, like it could have been. Okay, so you don't feel that's necessary. That's fine. Um, how do we move this forward? I mean, did, so I'll go back to what I said earlier. Can we vote to continue with this design group and leave it to you and the water commissioners to determine whether an addendum to the current scope of work or a new scope of work is created yep. and you guys just move? Yeah, I, yeah, I think you do vote to extend the agreement subject to a a revised scope of work. And then when what that looks like is up to you guys. Yeah. Okay. I, I would I would make that motion. I second that. Okay. One comment I had here, Ryan, if there's a section here that talks about 30 day payment of the uh is it for the design or is it design group or could you scroll down to where that is? And I guess my concern, it only talks about 30 day payment for them, but, and if they don't get, get it, uh, I think it was the page up, well, whatever, whichever way, uh, there's no provision for the town to terminate if nothing happens within 30 days. Is it, is it further up? 
all this is scope of work. All right, the right to suspend work. Town agrees Berkshire design is right to suspend work, any project with unpaid invoices over 30 days old. Yeah. Berkshire design has a right to suspend work. Yeah. Why can't we suspend work? If they decide they don't want to for some reason, it's gonna well, go over in 30 days. The first sentence of that paragraph says the contract may be terminated by Contract may be terminated without cause by either party with upon 10 days notice. Oh, right, number five, I'm talking about four, right to suspend work. Well, we're not doing the work, so we don't suspend it, right? I don't... Well, it's yeah. if we don't pay them, right? If we don't pay them uh, in 30 days, then they can suspend, they can hold back the future work if we don't pay them for the work that's already done. That's my that's my reading of that. It's that we don't suspend work. They would suspend work because they haven't been paid. If we want it, we just don't pay them and then they can suspend the work. But right. Is that I, Yeah, we can do everything up until up uh, to okay, terminating okay. the contract. Maybe I'm not reading it right, so Okay. Uh so we got a motion to for Brian and the uh, water commissioners to, to uh, work out the details here, and uh, what well, come come back with, to the board with a final decision on what you're doing, what's going to be done. Yeah, I'll 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 share the revised scope of work. On, yeah, uh, we need to revise scope of work. Right. Okay. If they agree to do the extra right. work okay. that we'll, I think they need to do. Roll we'll yeah. call vote. Joyce. Aye. Jonathan. Yeah. Fred, yes. Okay. Moving on under uh, new business. Discuss the creation of an emergency rental assistance program. Okay. Uh, Brian, do you want to start by saying what's been what's been proposed and sure I, I can set the table for the discussion. You, pro you might have more to say than me, Fred, but okay. Um, so it was it was discussed at the at a CPC meeting that the town consider um, establishing a, an emergency rental assistance program um, with CPA housing funds or CPA housing funds that have been transferred to the Whitley Housing Trust. Um, wait, so the funds that are in the Whitley Housing Trust are under the custody and control of the housing trustees. Whitley Housing Trustees, which are which is also the, the same folks as the Whitley Housing Committee. Um, so that's essentially what's been proposed. Um, I'll keep it short. And at the at the end of the last meeting, Fred, who's the the select board member of the Housing Committee, said he was going to um, try to convene a member uh, convene a meeting of the Housing Committee and Housing Trust. That happened on Monday night. Um, Monday evening, no, Monday at Monday afternoon. Um, and um, and Fred, do you want to share the what happened at that meeting? Okay. Uh, yeah, we had a, a meeting that the uh, housing uh, committee and the housing trust, because it was both uh, were being uh, asked to, to do something about rental housing for, for town residents. And I guess the discussion went there. We're, we're not sure that there was a need to do this for Whaley residents because we, for one, we don't know whether Whaley residents uh, uh, have a need for this and two, how many residents uh, would take advantage of this program and what else is available. And after doing some further investigation with uh, both FERCOG and the Franklin Regional Housing Authority, uh, there is a program available. The Housing Authority has a program to address rental assistance and even mortgage assistance to 
all of Franklin County residents. Their program has been in existence since July. It's still ongoing and there's still funding in it. And they're still dealing with people in that, in that program. It recently has, has more money given to it by the state. And I think there may be federal money coming in, a, in the near future to do that. They haven't turned around, turned up, turned against anybody applying. They've always considered people uh, that need that assistance. And they are currently dealing, they have been dealing with, with two families, well, two, uh, two, two, rent, two rental units in Whateley. They've been dealing with that, providing some assistance and that probably will continue. Uh, the, uh, and they don't see uh, th that will continue because more funds have been made available. The limit was $4,000 up until the last month or two. Now it's up to $10,000 for people to apply for this assistance. And the, the assistance has to come from requests by land, landowner, landlords. Tenants can't request, it has to go through a landlord to request assistance for this. So uh, they say there's money available, they have staff to administer this program uh, and they're dealing with the two in town already. Uh, so the question came, how many other residents could be eligible for this? Well, I've heard various numbers of 80 people or, and whatever, well, after investigating that and talking with FERCOG, there's 109 rental units in town. 109 based on census data. That's where that comes from. That's the only measure or the only, the only way we can track how many rental units we have in town. And that means multiple family and single, single resident owner residents that rent, that rent property. So you just can't look at, at uh, multiple units multiple occupant levels. Uh, there's 100, 109 based, on, like I say, on the census data that goes through 2019 data. That's updated kind of continually. Uh, we can't find who the 109 are. They, they, that's either privileged or it's not available. Uh, you have to get into the census data to see how people responded to the questionnaires. And, and I haven't found anybody that says they can do that for us. So what the housing committee has decided that uh, maybe good idea to reach out to these. Well, first we thought we could find out who the 109 were and send a mailing to them, contact to them and tell them this program is available if you need assistance. Well, it doesn't look right now that we can do that. So we're proposing to send a mailing on postcard to all uh, households in the town. There's like 680 whatever households in town to send a postcard, inform them of the program that Franklin County Housing Authority has available, contacts, website, and to go to that agency if they need rental assistance. Uh, the housing committee it is working on that on the language for that postcard. We are looking at that today. We're deciding what language to put on there and that could go out very, very soon. So that's what came from the housing committee uh, is, is to first find out what the need is and, and if it's overwhelming to the, to the region, maybe we could do something, but right now we don't know. We don't need to, we don't need to commit funds to the housing authority. They say that's not an issue. Funding is not an issue. And so uh, the housing trust decided that we're not taking any action now on committing trust funds to that until we know whether there is a need and an issue of funding for that program. So Fred, can I, I think that's great. Can I make a suggestion that in addition to the rental program that exists through the Frank through Franklin County yeah. that the postcard also include a link to the mortgage assistance yes that that will they're, they're both tied together kind they're, of they're tied yeah. together okay right um yeah. and, and then I, the the only thing 
I would add just to, to maximize the amplification is to call the recorder reporter that is assigned to Waitley okay. and encourage an article to be written about the fact that the postcard is going out um, and that the Waitley Housing um, Committee is taking proactive steps to make the, the assistance programs available and, and aware and, and increase awareness um, to Waitley residents, just because people might read a newspaper article before they read a postcard. And then I would also put it on uh, FCAT uh, public, public uh, announcements. Okay, sure, we, we, can, we can do that. And I don't know if you're aware, Lynn did a robocall last week and she mentioned at the end that housing assistance was available for rentals and mortgage. Yeah, I would just throw it, throw it on FCAT. People, people read that stuff. And then put it in the scoop, which is the deadlines coming up, you know, in what a month, Joyce, or something. All right. Okay. And the other thing we, we, we talked about, if we're going to do this postcard shortly about the uh, rental housing assistance on one side, whether the other side, we want to talk about the COVID uh, vaccination sites and, and website that's available to make an announcement, tell people here's where to go. At least we, we get it to everybody supposedly in town or more people that way in town. I, I think I, I worry you're stepping on your message. Are you <clears throat> okay? And 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 there are you know, Brian, you can talk to this perhaps better than I can, but there are <clears throat> strat plans underway to let people know about the vaccination schedule and, and locations when that becomes available, um, making sure that people trust that the vaccine is a, is a positive thing from that PR perspective. Um, I, I just think there's more to it than a postcard. And I think you're going to lose, you, 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 you're going to step on your own message, get the housing thing done. And, um, and the vaccination stuff can come from sources that are directly related to that need. Okay, that's, that's fine with me. I, I don't have any problem with that. Okay. Joyce, do you have anything you want to say? No, okay. There we go, I was muted, sorry. Uh, no, I think um, I agree with what, what you guys have worked out here. Yeah, yeah, we're, Proceeding, and we'll see what what we get, what responses, and and uh, I guess uh, the the regional housing authority is willing to work with us and, and to work with Waitley residents, and whatever they ask, you know, they 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 have a program to do that to verify people that apply and all, and what I read it, it takes like three to five weeks to get all this action approved, whoever applies, so it's not a phone call or one one page for application it takes some review involvement of of legal things uh, personal uh, financial issues and all that kind of stuff so uh I, they're suited for that they've been doing it for a while so okay okay brian do you have anything else you want to add no nope. okay uh Next item on a new business is discuss and vote to submit an application to the uh, Furcogs District Local Technical Assistance Program. Okay, I think you gave us all the, uh, I guess, categories or whatever that we could apply for on uh, in our recent uh, submittal there. Yeah, the, the application form was included in the, in the yeah. meeting material. Um, now, really, what, what, what have we done last year? We applied for what housing and, and envir the uh, EV stations, and was it the uh, some plan, uh, open space plan? What did we do last year? No, we did open space with uh, CPA in, in the grant we're going to get. Uh, well, it was definitely housing because they're, they're doing that work now. Right. We're in um, I, I'd have to go back and look. Uh, uh, okay. Um, 
uh, for this year, what so items that ha that have come up and uh, Jonathan, you might be able to speak more about this one, but there's there's a request for uh, uh, needs assessment at the South County Senior Center. Um, I also had an email that that I think it was it was from FERCOG staff suggesting that that the folks should consider um, highlighting the COVID vaccine um, category as um, as something that should be a high priority. Um, I think this was before FEMA came out and, and suggested that that all vaccination clinic costs are going to be reimbursed by FEMA. Um, so I don't know that that's as critical. And I received an email from the planning board and they had a request that we consider um, two zoning issues. One, um, helping them with uh, amendments to uh, the second, um, research into the risk posed by large scale lithium energy storage batteries. So we can provide adequate protection in our solar facility bylaw was one request. And then the other one was for help with the state floodplain bylaw. Um, there, is a, there is a requirement um, that municipalities um, amend their floodplain bylaw in accordance with um, some new regulations that have been adopted at the, there's no deadline, but it, it says that they need to do it at the next available time, essentially. So the next annual town meeting. Um, and they were planning boards looking for some help with that. Um, as as um, Fred alluded to, there there is FERCOG is doing some some of the uh, background work on a housing needs assessment um, that we requested in the previous DLTA application. Um, so that's also something that could be continued, I would think. Um, but it, so they're asking for the top three. I'm, I'll, I'm going to put in a plug for having the uh, needs assessment as our number one priority. Um, we have an aging population. We have an inadequate senior center facility right now um, to meet current needs, let alone future needs. Um, and this is not an assessment of the building structure. This is an assessment to determine current needs of seniors, but also future needs of seniors, both needs and interests. What do seniors want to see uh, made available in terms of programming, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, assistance, you know, anything a senior needs currently and in the future. Uh, the assessment would include people not just currently um, in their golden years, uh, but also include people probably 45 and up to really get a sense of, you know, of, of getting people thinking about, well, you know what, in 20 years, I'm, you know, 20, 25 years, I will be looking at retirement. How do I want to spend my time? What are my needs? What do I anticipate my needs going to be? What do I anticipate my social life that I want that to be? Um, it's a very comprehensive needs assessment. And, and I think, and the other towns are, go I'm hoping that the towns of Deerfield and Sunderland will also make it their top priority, um, and 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 we're we're kicking it off here tonight. Jonathan, is this just in regard to the senior center? Are you talking? Are you talking all senior activities? Well, the theory is, Fred, that the senior center should be the epicenter of a lot of senior support, senior activities, etc. The COA feeds into the senior center. Um, you know, the, the senior center is a is a is a is a structure that can be that epicenter if you want. You know, I've seen senior centers with 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 pool rooms for seniors. They've had dart rooms. They've had, you know, they they they've had different function rooms for different for different interests of the seniors. I, I half joke around if somebody, if they wanted to put a bar in the senior center, put a bar in the senior center, you know, what, find out what seniors are interested in having as part of their center and peripheral activities. And then we can determine the type of facility and only then can we determine the type of facility that we need. And then can we determine what, what is affordable and what's not affordable. But right now we're, we're throwing darts with, a blindfold on. Yeah, I, 
I, I agree with what, what you're saying. And, and again, focusing a lot on this, on the senior center, where it should be, what it looked like and what, what's it going to provide, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe it, some of that, I, I think, it, it, not not to detract from from this, but it, it's it's also covered in other activities for for seniors on on this request. I think as well. There's a dementia age and dementia group, and then there's uh, I, I forget what what the other ones are. Well, housing. We're trying to address some housing issues here, hopefully, but. Uh, mm -hmm. It, it can all feed into that. And then the other, the other point that I would make is that there are some people who, and, and I'm, I'm probably one of them, or at least 50% of me is one of them, um, that wonders whether it should be, it, it should have a, a dual purpose of a, of a community center type, type thing where by day it's a senior center and by night it's a community center that, that would maximize functionality and would also provide sort of a, a, a seamless transition. I'm, uh, you know, Young, younger people are using it for certain functions and then and then adults that are that are they're that are parenting age or or you know 30s 40s 50s are using it for certain things and then there's this comfortableness around oh yeah i'm just going to keep using this facility as i get into the 60 65 70 range and 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 eliminate the absolute stigma that exists around oh yeah i i use the senior center because it's an absolute stigma and, and having it as a quasi community center might provide a, re, a relief to that stigma. But again, that's just, that, that's just hypothesis on my part that would be proven or not um, by a needs assessment, but, but we have to start somewhere. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that, and Brian, I don't know that this is possible, but I would, I would love for us to, to, to have the, the senior center needs assessment is number one but in the event that the other two set towns don't follow suit with having that as their number one, um, do we have the ability to, to pivot so we don't lose our number one? Uh, yeah, I'm sure we could give Linda a call. Okay. Or, or something like making the senior center more what, accessible to, or to Waitley residents? <laughs> well, it's accessible now, but that's a, that, that you know, that's that's expanding PVTA. That's expanding. I mean, yes. I mean, those are things that we talk about all the time. Yeah. But that's not a function of the building necessarily. That's not a, fun, no. that's a function of a lot of variables that are in and outside of our control. You know, the poor the poor residents of Sunderland. You know, they they have a hard time getting access to the the senior center if they're not driving because. Their 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 um, PBTA and PBTA doesn't go to Deerfield. Well, not anymore. Yeah. Right. So it's just the dysfunctionality of our current public transit system, where where we have you know two different transit systems because they and they clearly can't play well in the sandbox with each other. Um. So, but 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 th that's a little bit outside the scope. But it would be, I mean, it's clearly something that that all these stakeholders need to discuss separate from the needs assessment. Yeah. So you're talking about location and then, and then maybe a program needs. Location, program, building scope, all those types of things. And I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of agreement that, that downtown South Deerfield is, a, is, is the location of, that would be ideal because you can walk to the post office, you can walk to the bank, you can walk to a convenience store, you can, you can walk to different services where if you're downtown some other place you don't necessarily have that option right. um but it's 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 the size of the building it's the facilities in it's the amenities inside the building um but again and people say well we should have x how do we know we should have x if we don't know what seniors want right so has there been a survey recently on what seniors want no that's the point of this needs assessment I, I think there's there's been surveys, Fred, in the past. I think they've largely been inconclusive, but I think that it's just, as far as like figuring out what's the next step forward, a needs assessment is a really good first step. 
And because I think that's been the problem in the past is people couldn't agree on what do we need and what do seniors need? What do they want? Because we're just over surveyed and we're not really getting, and we're not really getting the information we need from some simple surveys. Um, so I think a, a needs assessment that is spot on for uh, a project that's kind of in that area of our concern. But I would want to speak up as a second choice, especially if the other towns won't put that as their first priority. The um, getting some professional help on battery storage. There was a huge, in my opinion, okay, debacle last year where just a complete lack of scientific and engineering facts in the room uh, you know, led to uh, a lot of a lot of problems, and and you know, nearly outlawing electric batteries, which would outlaw my car essentially, in uh, in Waitley, and that um, if we can get the planning board some, you know, rational outside help on determining what are real safety issues and what are made up ones, um, then I think that sort of situation won't happen a second time. I really think that that was really sad watching that all play out last year. Um, so I, I would support putting the senior center needs assessment or whether it's a senior center needs assessment or, or a, a senior support needs assessment as our first, but I would really wanna put something about getting expert expert advice on battery storage, bylaw, sorts of, uh, you know, the support we would need to have something that's reasonable in our bylaws. I think that would be a, a to me, a really close second. I, I think that's a, that's a great, that's a great one, two punch personally. Do, do any of our solar installations today have battery backup? I think there was one that want that was going to have right now. You basically right now, no. if you want to build solar, you have to put in batteries. There really aren't any incentives otherwise. But now so that it exists, from here moving forward, is it would be the case. Okay. None of the existing ones. I, I don't believe they have battery storage. Existing no. ones, right? But but again, it's battery storage is the future. Make no mistake about it. Um, it is it is the way to get it to 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 make it work to make it and scale it and and make it a, a more a more uh essential part of base load it, it just you know it's it's the future and we're either going to embrace the future or we're going to turn our back on the future okay yeah i have i have no problem with with these first two that's come up uh one has been on the list, and I guess we talk about it, and it came up in the vulnerability assessment was one of Keith's activities there of culverts. Uh, are we going to do that under a, a future grant under the MVP program, or is that something we should look at here? Culvert needs assessment or culvert survey, whatever it's called. I thought that was teed up for MVP, but I could be wrong. I think that's MVP eligible for sure. Yeah. Okay, so is that what we were saying? We'll wait for that program rather than here? I also sort of think that the state of our culverts is something that I, I'm pretty sure we have a pretty good handle on. I mean, may, maybe I'm wrong about that and maybe Keith can chime in, but I mean, we're, our highway department's out on our roads all the time, and I think they know which culverts are problematic. What's the next step? I don't know, but I, th I think they do. Yeah, I, I feel the MVP program is probably where that ty these type of replacements in improvements should be funded through. Because I think this is just saying a needs assessment here, uh, if, if I understood that right. Um, I was on that first page there, culvert assessments. Assess culverts to identify which crossings are at risk. I think Keith already knows which ones are at risk. 
So, and, and maybe Keith would like help with that assessment or confirmation, but I, I feel like we've got, we've got that knowledge already and I don't think we should ask for it in this particular grant. I think we're ready to go to MVP with actual, hey, this culvert needs replacement and, and we're at that level. I agree. Okay, kind of related to culverts since it would involve culverts. We talked one time and I don't know if it was this program or something else about the Christian Lane and State Road intersection to trying to do something there that would improve traffic flow. Uh, I don't know if that, would that fit under here an infrastructure project or something, Brian, or? Yes, I mean, that, that would be an MVP project. Okay. Well, when, when is this, when we need a response by Brian? Uh, February 5th, they're asking. So it's this meeting. Mm. Yeah, last year, Fred, last year it was housing uh, one to three, housing planning, aging and dementia friendly community planning and Brownfields redevelopment support. And we got the housing piece. Why don't we put the aging and dementia planning as the third? Third one. That would be my okay. suggestion. I, I would not oppose that. That's fine. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I would be shocked if we don't get our number one if the other two towns follow suit. Right. Okay. Do we need to take an action on this, Brian? Yeah. Well, I move that we um, uh, apply for the uh, local technical assistance request uh, with the three priorities we just discussed. First, needs assessment for South County seniors. Second, uh, technical assistance for bylaws regarding battery installation. And third, uh, see, Ironically, I can't remember that one because I believe it's about the, like the, the dementia, oh, dementia, dementia, living, living in dementia or something. Yeah, um, something dementia. about people forgetting stuff all the time. So ironically, that's my motion. Okay, I'd second that. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, we'll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yep. Fred? Yes. And, and Joyce, what I'm also going to do, uh, just as an aside, is I'm going to reach out to the Solar Energy Industries Association to see if they have any advice on how to find the type of information that would be our second choice, should we not get to our second choice, because yeah. it really is, it really is critical. Right. We still, I mean, we still need that to be done, whether we get this grant or not. Exactly. But because I, I think we, we can't just have, or, yeah, we can't just have a bunch of people coming in with whatever they found on the internet and saying what they did so great so i'll make that call and just see what i get perfect okay moving on uh next item is review to fiscal year 2022 budget review schedule brian proposed a schedule that starts in what march, march. i guess march and goes through uh well june i guess or end of may Yeah, and I, I, I worked on this with, with Paul and Taya. Um, so there would be, um, so the 16th, the 23rd, um, and April 6th would be joint meetings with the Select Board and Finance Committee, where we would ask, um, well, what I hope to do this year, uh, if I could just go back for one second, is is before we meet, I, I'd like to get the entire budget together. Um, and then there could be a meeting of the finance committee and select board and, and figure out um, which budgets we actually want to uh, review in depth to try to uh, streamline the process a little bit, especially if these are gonna be Zoom meetings. Zoom meetings are, my experience have been, or, or can be inefficient in terms of how long they go. Um, so I think it would be good if we, if we can sort of get down to it. 
um, and talk about those budgets that need to be talked about. Um, and then there would be some finance only meetings and the select board would, would, would have their regular meetings as well. And they need to discuss those things. So um, I just wanted to see if these three dates of the joint meetings would work for the board. Yeah, I think so far they're acceptable to me. I think I reinforce what you're saying, Brian, about trying to reduce the, the length of time we talk about all these budget items and uh, to try to maybe condense some of these or eliminate some of the meetings. I, you know, I think you, you do a great job of preventing, presenting all the information and all, and it gets discussed and hashed over and commented on and it goes on and on. Uh, sometimes I wonder, are we gaining anything by that discussion? Uh, other times, yes, we are. I, I think that we should seriously look at, at reducing the number of these meetings. I think the discussion time limits should be set uh, in inverse proportion or in proportion, which I should say, to the uh, to the dollar amount on the budget. I, I cannot I like believe how many times we spent 30 minutes arguing about $300. Right. Um, I, yeah. I, I would agree with Joyce 100% on that. The other thing that we usually have a conversation about the previous year and you know the the past fiscal year has so little <laughs> sense of, of of reality just because of, of of spending patterns because of of living in the COVID world. Um, so I I really am not sure that it's going to be a a fruitful discussion to talk about why well, why why wasn't X Y or Z budget um, spent because it just are you know so many budgets were their hands were tied at some level. Well, and I guess rather than taking up time at a meeting, Jonathan, I guess if we still wanted to get a response, ask for something in writing and, and just share it with us. And, and that's it, unless people want to bring it up again. I mean. We say it again, Fred, I missed that. If, if there is a big difference and, and people, it could be an issue, have the department or committee explain it ahead of time, put something in writing. Brian does a good job of explaining a lot of things in, in writing ahead of, ahead of time. Do that ahead of the meeting. That would save probably some time during the meeting. So it sounds like you'd have, we would want the people who are supposed to be at the meeting to read the meeting materials ahead of time and ask those questions. <laughs> um, or, or, or the people presenting it, the people, you know, people responsible for that budget to present a written explanation ahead of time. And maybe well, that's enough. Don't necessarily know what your question is going to be. So, no, if, or not you, I'm, I'm not really picking on you. I'm picking on somebody who um, maybe when they present it, they know $300 for this item is completely reasonable, but someone else has a question about it. So that's what, that's how we end up spending 30 minutes discussing $300. Okay. Well, but I think I think we could certainly um, get to a point in a meeting where we say, "Well, here's our questions. Let's not argue about the answers. Get the answers, and they can come. Uh, they they can be answered outside of meeting time." Yep. Okay. But I, I like how it's it's um, like every week there's one meeting, but there aren't very many weeks. At least not that I've. I've gone through March and the beginning of April. <laughs> there aren't uh, any weeks I can see where we have both uh, selectmen and finance committee back to back in one week. And I really appreciate that. Me too. <laughs> yeah. And I know we have not picked an annual meeting date. We only decided to postpone till June. Um, where along the lines here, do you think we need to make the town meeting date decision? I think I think Brian proposed something at the end, didn't you? Oh well, that's yeah, that's a possibility. possibility. Yeah, that's right. I think we said fifty um, tentative, and that was so. That's still our target, I guess. Yeah. Uh, when it seems to me, if we could get into, if we get to the end of March, and we're still looking like where this is a reasonable schedule, 
we yeah. should just make that official. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that makes sense. Do we need a vote on this? No, I just wanted to make sure we were we were on the same page as we start this process again. Okay. So if, if we, if we're okay with this, then it's probably, this is likely to be the schedule. I can start putting things in my calendar. Yeah. That, yep. Okay. And we'll continue with the second and last Wednesdays for select board. That was my assumption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I guess I think we all agree that this looks reasonable, Brian. So let's proceed with it. Okay. Moving on. Uh, this goes vote to appoint this Jonathan Edwards and Andy Mahalik to the Tritown Beach Commission. So moved. I'll second that. Okay. This John Edwards, his name keeps coming up all the time. Yeah, I don't know. He must. Yeah, well, this John Edwards is going to be going to be exiting some of the committees pretty soon. Is, is he a lifeguard? Uh no. Well, I, when I was, you know, a young. I boss. have to be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've uh, got a motion, second. Okay, we'll call a vote. Uh, Joyce. Hi. Brad. Yes. Uh, Jonathan for. <laughs> Andy, okay. Yes, okay. Okay, moving on to town administrator updates. Yeah. Um, so the energy committee uh, received an email from Colonial Power. This is the, the, the company that's assisting the town with the municipal aggregation program. Um, and they're going to uh, we're going to be having a, a call about um, including a low-income discount to the municipal aggregation program. Um, so I just wanted to mention that to the full board, which everybody except Fred probably knew that because they probably received the email. But um, there's going to be further discussions on that. Um, East Waitley School, we haven't talked about in a long time. Um, I reached out to Bob O'Bear. Um, to see what was happening with that. And he said that they ran into a roadblock with, there it is. Um, they've been rejected by the Mass Historic Commission um, on part two of the application. This is for the historic tax credits to help with the financing. Um, he said they've been rejected by Mass Historic Commission for a fourth time. Um, and He's not really sure what they're going to do, but um, they're possibly thinking about maybe advertising it for some commercial uses. I still think that's subject to zoning. Uh, long story short, um, I reached out to him and suggested that it may make sense uh, that we try to engage some of our state reps and uh, state rep and state senator um, to see if we can't get any movement on the tax credits. Um, I think that's um, it's probably a spot where we could help uh, just try to get some movement on that. I don't know. I, I, I asked him if it was sort of a technical issue with the application or, or the building that doesn't make it as attractive. Um, and he seemed to think it was more of a, a preference thing, which I think is something we could work on. Um, so Alfred, uh, he was going to call me back today, but uh, we never connected. Um, so we may schedule a meeting in the near future to, to try to talk about the future of that of that project. Um, what's what do I have next here? Um, electrical electric vehicle and center program. The I believe the energy committee is still investigating that um, as I look at the energy committee member on the on the select board. Yeah. Um, right. I think there's some research taking place there. Um, Green Communities Grant Program still has not been released. Um, I 
I did talk with uh, the engineer that's, well, Berkshire Design Group, who, who's working on some of those things with the water department, and they had committed to doing kind of a, um, a quick calculation as to if improvements on the, the our existing infrastructure would would pan out, so to speak, uh, and uh, make financial sense and thus qualify for green communities. Um, so they're going to get back to us on that. Um, there was an article in the Gazette uh, that that I saw. I think it was sent to me yesterday. And I guess if you have any questions, you could ask Keith on this. But I think the two fiftieth committee has has suggested that all all of their major activities in terms of the two fiftieth be postponed until twenty twenty two. Wait, wait, two fifty one. Right. We'll have, to, we'll have to change that cake, put an extra candle in somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there may, Keith, there was some talk about maybe doing something on the actual date of incorporation, right? That was a topic of discussion. However, you know, I'm not sure if that will be happening or not. I mean, that was trying to maybe do a mobile, a mobile parade through town of some sort. Um, I think I like a larger Santa parade. Yes. Okay. okay. For, for that, for that date, that's in April, what, 26th? I think. 20, yeah. Something April, 20 something. 26th. That's, that's on a Monday. Uh, I would like to see, uh, well, we have a select board meeting the, the 28th, maybe move our select board meeting to the 26th and at least maybe, uh, have Rita, if we can get a proclamation that, that of the incorporation date or something from Boston that we could read to everybody on the 26th as part of our meeting and maybe leave it up to the to 250th committee what else they want to do on, on that day as part of a part of a Zoom meeting and we put stuff in the newspapers and, and, and whatever. Uh, move our meeting to the 26th, uh, April 26th for, an, for our incorporation date and recognize that and say, now we're continuing and here's where we are and, and whatever, whatever happens from the committee, whatever they want to do on that day. Mm -hmm. Do I? <laughs> I think we should take it to the committee and, and ask them. I suspect they would be quite favorable to something yeah. like that. I, mean, I, I got to believe the proclamation would be easy enough to get. So yeah, and we can read it, present it, or show it, or whatever for that day. Move our meeting till that day. Is that okay. Right, we, we can discuss that at the next two fifty meeting. Sure. But at least, I, well, I guess I'm proposing moving the select board meeting till the twenty sixth. Then is that okay with everybody? That would... Um, I think let's let's. Right now? I, I'm fine with that, um, but yeah. I, I'm also on the 250th committee, and if they schedule a parade for 6 p.m., I'm going to be looking out my window at the parade okay. well, and not paying attention to our meeting. So I, I, is it urgent that we that we make the date change tonight? No. We, no. Yeah. Okay. Make it available. Just yeah. make it available in case we get a proclamation or something to read from the governor for that day. We can we can do it that day. Or we can have a speaker on the back of a flatbed reading the proclamation across town. Right. Yeah, that's a possibility. To, to kind of like the constant, you know, kind of like the Declaration of Independence going from place to place. Yeah. To really be riding a horse, though. Yeah, me and Paul. Horse and carriage. <laughs> okay, are we done? I uh, think so. I think I'm I, done. I have one on one item that's come to mind. Uh, kind of some of the some of the discussion Brian presented about the, his involvement in the uh, water department uh, district merger and also. Kind of the the rental housing uh, activities that we're we're getting into, uh, and realizing that you know Brian has got a lot on his plate, and he does a good job of everything that comes his way. We helped him prioritize. We went through the the list of priority items a couple months ago, 
Uh, we still see things come up that are not on the list, but uh, I'd like to suggest that he look at, at adding more hours to maybe Amy's position or, or something else. And, and the reason I, I say that is looking at the survey that just came out from, from uh, FERCOG of, of uh, select, not select board, what administrative staff, some of them have a 40 hour position as an assistant to the midtown administrator. And I guess I would like Brian to, to look at that and see whether uh, he could get more hours either out of Amy or, or other people there or rearrange your staff so you would get more, more assistance than uh, I think what is Amy, 20 hours? A week? 24. 24. 24 plus some for budget season. Right. And, and if, if she would like to, to get more hours or, or somebody else, uh, I, you know, I, I think we're, we're doing good as a, a town. I'd like to continue that. And we got a lot of things coming up, a lot of projects that involve Brian's time more so than ever. And, and uh, I think he needs as much help as he can get. Do you, Brian, uh, Joyce, Jonathan, do you think that's an option that, that we should be looking at or Brian should be looking at? Yeah, I, I, I thought about that um, with the meeting material that Brian sent regarding how, you know, if uh, if we were to somehow want to go into, you know, starting up a uh, like a housing assistance program within the town, that that was really just going to break the bank as far as right. time is concerned. But it, like right now, it doesn't look like we want to press on that. Uh, but the same thing occurred. It occurred to me that um, if if Brian needs more help uh, to get things that we have made priorities, then um, I think he's been pretty good about asking for it in the past and anticipating um, things like I'm going to need more help during budget season. Can we expand Amy's hours during the budget season and so on? So my guess is I I, I guess I would say um, that uh, I think Brian would be a good judge of that. And it might be that with the water merger, there might be a temporary need over the next year for more hours. But I, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to um, impose on him the mandate to go, you know, find more hours or make Amy work harder than. And like, I don't know if Amy can take on more hours, honestly. So uh, I, I guess I would, I would let that um, just voice my support for the idea that if you need more help to ask for it. And, um, but I would le uh, let any initiation of that request come from Brian. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Okay. Jonathan, do you have anything you wanna say? You're muted. <laughs> my, my dog was barking, so I had to mute. Mm. Um, I agree with Joyce. Brian hasn't been shy about flapping his gums when he needs something. Um, so I would leave that to him. You know, one of the things that I've thought about, but you know, I don't know if this is, creates more work or is, is alleviating of work is, is to uh, get an, an intern from the public policy and administration program over at UMass master's degree program just just as an extra set of, of, of very inexpensive hands during those busy times. Um, that's the only thought, but again, that would be up to Brian to decide whether that that creates more work and, and not and not less. But let Brian let Brian drive it. Okay, I guess I, I bring it up now because we're approaching budget season and if Brian needs more help, more hours, that would be the time to ask for it. Through, I guess through what personnel committee first, and in a in a budget season to put more of that in our in our budget. So uh, yeah. rather than try to do it later on, and we missed the opportunity. So yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll I'll put some thought into it. I mean, I'm also hearing from from the planning board often that they wish they had more help. Um, mm. um you, you know, in terms of. Mm in terms of working on the zoning and sort of that proactive planning, um, you know, in terms of if we're going to pursue more housing planning, that types, you know, those types of things were, 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 were hit and miss as to what FERCA can provide us. Um, so, so there are some things there's, there's economic development that 
Yeah. That I would love to pursue. You know, Jonathan and I have talked about the area around exit 24. Um, you know, there's things to do with Tritown Beach. Uh, we have the center school still sitting there. So there's there's some stuff that doesn't move quick that 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 maybe it, it might help. It might help to have help, but I would want to put a little bit more thought into it and, and to see what that would look like. Um, you know, there's always grants to apply for um, and grants to administer, mm. but we'd have you know, to and, and, and the and other, the it. other, the other thing that, you know, we really should do the research on, I don't know where I stand on it, but the, but having more information on the, on the conversation we had with the finance committee uh, back in December around the, the tax rate, the tax rate ratio, yep. that's research. That's not just a, Hey, let's have a drink and figure it out. That's, that's gotta be data driven. Well, some some of that will come from the uh, assessor's office and and the uh, consultant in the state that we work with on setting tax rates and looking at data. So we will take the assessors will take a take some role in that. It won't. Well, it's, course, not, right. it's not going to come just on Brian to figure that out. No, that's my that's exactly my point, Fred. But it, but it, but there's a, a coordination of it all that that takes bandwidth right so okay yeah okay um, anything can else to, can we move to adjourn yes okay we'll call vote joyce all right jonathan yep fred yes okay meeting is adjourned